I think we'll go ahead and get started by the time I get finished with my opening statement. Hopefully, um, uh, Ranking Member Kucinich will, uh, will be able to join us. Let me thank you all for coming to this uh, hearing on duplication, overlap, and inefficiencies uh, in the area of federal wealth, uh, welfare programs. Um, start with an opening statement, and then, like I say, hopefully that uh, Mr. Kucinich will be here. As, he, as I speak, he walks in. It's great to have you with us today. In March, the Government Accountability Office released the first annual report on duplicative and fractured federal spending. The report estimated that conservatively, $100 billion could be saved each year, $100 billion each year, by eliminating duplication, overlap, and fragmentation in numerous federal programs. Congress considers the federal budget on an agency-by-agency agency or program-by-program program basis. The GAO report was the first attempt at a comprehensive view of federal spending by function. Today, in what will likely be the first of a series of hearings, the subcommittee will begin taking a more focused look at GEO's findings, starting with the area of social welfare programs. Since Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty in 1964, Americans have spent $16 trillion on welfare at the state and federal level. Under current administration plans, $10 trillion more will be spent over the next decade. How much of that spending will be wasted on duplicative programs, each with their own overhead, IT budgets, bureaucracy, and advertising budgets? How much of that spending will be wasted on a program that fails to help the people it's designed to help, the targeted population, while a different program with an identical mission may be succeeding with less money? GAO found that the federal government spent more than $90 billion on 18 different domestic food and nutrition assistance programs, more than $18 billion on 47 different programs providing employment and training programs, and $3 billion on 20 different homelessness programs. The federal government also currently funds 80 programs at eight different agencies to provide transportation services to, quote, transportation disadvantaged uh, persons. While GAO was unable to figure out exactly how much these 80 programs cost the American taxpayers, it was able to determine that a small subset of them totaled $2 billion annually. GAO has also concluded that not enough is known about the effectiveness of many of these programs. For example, they found that only 7 of 18 federal food assistance programs have been associated with positive health and nutrition outcomes, while the remaining 11 have not been effective. The President has signaled his intent to address federal program duplication. In his State of the Union address, President Obama stated that, quote, we shouldn't just give our people a government that's more affordable. We should give them a government that's more competent and more efficient. American people would certainly agree with that. Two weeks later, the President addressed the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, reiterating his plan to address duplicative programs. So in the coming months, my administration will develop a proposal to merge, consolidate, and reorganize the federal government in a way that best serves the goal of a more competitive America. I hope the administration is serious about duplication and waste. More than a month ago, I invited the White House of Management, uh, the White House Office of Management uh, and Budget, to participate in today's hearing. Unfortunately, as was the case with the previous full committee hearing on GAO's duplicative programs report, the White House Office of Management and Budget has refused to engage with this committee on meaningful oversight of wasteful federal spending. I mean, I think this is amazing. The Office of Management and Budget. The Office of Management and Budget refuses to come talk to this committee about the management of the 70-some different means-tested social welfare programs. The American taxpayers deserve better than what our current system provides. They deserve a budget system in which all programs providing aid can be viewed in full and can be easily tracked and evaluated for effectiveness and efficiency. They deserve a welfare system whose goal is to actually help people quickly reach the point where they no longer need it and can provide for themselves, not one in which multiple departments and multiple agencies manage programs that waste money through overlap and inefficiency. I appreciate the willingness of our witnesses to join us today for what I think is a very important hearing in these, in these crucial fiscal times when we're trying to help the very people in these, this tough economy who want to who wanna be helped. And with that, I would yield to my good friend, the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much for calling this hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for their presence. Uh, today's hearing addresses a recently issued Government Accountability Office report. That report focused on duplicative federal programs hi and highlighted opportunities to potentially enhance federal revenues by reducing inefficiencies and overlap. In a 339-page report, GAO devoted just 18 pages to addressing opportunities that may exist for reducing costs and improving the efficiency of certain federal programs uh, most notably food assistance programs and job training programs. In both the continuing resolution votes as well as other budget proposals, 
These programs in particular were targeted for severe cuts. GAO's findings are valuable, as long as they're not misunderstood. GAO recommended streamlining the administration of multiple programs delivering comparable benefits to similar overlapping populations. Reducing administrative inefficiencies in federal welfare programs is an important goal that we should work together to address. But GAO did not, did not find waste, fraud, or abuse in the administration and delivery of these programs. And GAO does not recommend delivering fewer benefits to those in need. Um, in the aftermath of the most economically destructive recession since the Great Depression, poverty has been on the rise. According to the Food Research and Action Center, nearly one in five Americans struggled to afford enough food for themselves and their families in 2010. In Ohio, the home, uh, our home state, uh, the, uh, there were 1.7 million people living in poverty in 2009, many remaining in poverty even though they work full-time year-round. <coughs> As uh, Lisa Hamler uh, Fugit, Executive Director of the Ohio Association of Second Harvest Food Banks, who's testifying before us today, will confirm, in the state of Ohio, the level of food insecurity is greater than 13 percent, the highest level in a generation. This statistic alone shows how dire the need is, how critical federal food assistance programs are in Ohio and nationwide. Our economy is showing positive signs of improvement, but with unemployment still at 9%, it's certainly no time to be pulling the plug on food assistance programs. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I had a, a visit from uh, Ms. Uh, Hamlet Fugit, uh, and she, she gave me uh, these plates, which mm -hmm. are, are filled out by people who are participating in one of the uh, the food programs. And, and in the time that I have remaining, I, I just want to give uh, these uh, individuals a chance for their voice to be heard. Um, to whom it may concern, the Hunger Center to me is like a godsend. Without the Food Center, I don't know how I would survive every month. Food stamps uh, don't make it each, each month. Thank you for your support. Um, Another one, I'd like to thank uh, God for Avon Baptist Church. God is good, and I'm thankful for a Avon Baptist Church helping me and my grandchildren at a time of need. Um, Food Center has been so good to me and my family and grandchildren. Time is hard, and I thank God for the center. The food pantry uh, have helped me and my kids uh, have food, and some days I don't know what me and my kids would have done uh, without this center, center really uh, helps people and uh, their kids. Uh, again, this is about the Avon Avenue Baptist Church Food Bank. It's been an enormous uh, helping hand to my family, and I greatly appreciate the three-course meals that uh, all of uh, that uh, lasts us all month. It's only by the grace of God that my family and I have been fed when we had no money at all. The volunteers at the food bank have helped uh, out this community uh, the best way they can and they'll be blessed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Avon, uh, uh, hungry for providing extra nutrition for my family. May God continue to bless you. Uh, through the hard times, I'm able to get food and clothing here at Avon and also smiles with good people who really care. Uh, I don't know what uh, I would do without uh, their, their help. God bless. Uh, finally, help me to feed my family. Great help to make it through the month. They give good food that uh, you can make meals. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, is uh, if I could uh, put <coughs> this into the record as signed by people, and, and maybe it could be transcribed so that uh, these voices of people who are affected by this program should have a chance to be heard. Certainly, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Thank and, and I, I just want to echo, too. I, I've had the opportunity to visit one of the Second Harvest Food Bank um, centers and do appreciate the work they do. And the, the, the whole focus of this hearing, you know, and I want to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the whole focus of this hearing is to look to do things more efficiently, more effectively to help the very people that, that you were just quoting there. If, if I can, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I, I have... Uh, tremendous confidence in, in your compassion and your quality of heart. And I, I just wanted to, uh, to make sure that while we were here discussing this, that these individuals had a, had a chance to be heard. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually, I'm Mr. Uh, Mr. Cummings, I'm going to recognize Ms. Burkle for a quick statement, and then we'll go to you. And then hopefully we can get our witness testimony in before we have to run vote. Go ahead, Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this uh, hearing today. 
When the GAO published its report in March on duplication in government services, I was very concerned that we were not, or we were wasting taxpayer dollars. So I'm glad that the committee is, is digging into these issues. I think we, we walk a fine balance. There's no one that doesn't understand the need for these services. But we owe it to the American people to make sure that there's an effective and an efficient use of those dollars that we're using for the programs. Uh, the report covered a very broad range of programs, so we're going to focus on some of those today. That report stated that the federal government spent over $62 billion on 18 different domestic food and nutrition programs for low-income individuals in fiscal year 2008. The GAO reported stated that these programs showed signs of overlap and inefficient use of resources. It also mentioned we fund 47 different programs across multiple agencies to provide employment and training service to help the unemployment get jobs. With triple, excuse me, with trillion dollar deficits, we cannot let this continue. We need to find the programs that work so that they work efficiently, they work effectively, and they reach the people who need their help. We, don't, we need to end this duplication and waste and find ways to get people into private sector jobs which really gives people back their dignity. I look forward to the opportunity to hearing from all of our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from New York and now recognize the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I certainly appreciate your courtesy. In February, the Government Accountability Office issued a 339-page report on potential duplication in federal programs. It described areas of overlap in several major programs, including defense, agriculture, energy, and homeland security. The majority decided to focus today's hearing on a tiny subset of these programs that help some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society, those in need of food, housing, transportation, and job training. The majority is targeting these same programs for significant cuts in their 2012 budget proposals. The Center on Budget and Policy Parties estimates that two-thirds of the Republican budget's programmatic spending cuts are to programs that serve people of limited means. That's $2.9 trillion of a total of $4.3 trillion. The fact that low-income assistance is being targeted in this way is especially troubling, given, given the Republican ultimatum last year to force the extension of all of President Bush's tax cuts for the nation's wealthiest individuals. It is even more troubling in light of their recent efforts to protect lucrative tax breaks for oil companies making record profits. Americans across the country are struggling to overcome the impact of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. According to an October 2010 report issued by the Congressional Research Service, 3.7 million more people fell in below poverty line in 2009 compared to 2008. These 3.7 million people were pushed into poverty by a recession they did not create. In 2009, a total of 43.6 million people had incomes below the poverty line here in America, more than, a, than at any time since we began tracking this measure in 1959. The increase in poverty in America has been uh, accompanied by increased hunger. In fact, in its report in February, in February, the GAO found that in 2008, nearly 17 million households experienced insecurity in food, meaning they had limited access to food during some part of the year. In my hometown of Baltimore, 40 miles away from here, 13.3 percent of families with children fall into this unfortunate category. These are horrible statistics, um, but they are the benchmarks against which we measure our success as a society. I believe that we all, that with all my heart, that our nation is better than this. We can do better, and we must do better. Of course, we must strive to eliminate unnecessary duplication and streamline the delivery of benefits. There is no one on this side of the aisle or that other side of the aisle would, that would disagree with that. But, Mr. Chairman, I hope that the Republican idea of duplicative food assistance programs is not breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We must be clear about our priorities, ensuring that every hungry child is adequately fed and that every sick person has access to medical care and that every family has a safe place to live. This is the American way. These efforts not only help our fellow Americans get back on their feet, but they ensure that our next generation is ready to compete and succeed. The future of our country is in their hands. Mr. Chairman, protecting the poor should not be a partisan issue. 
In, in his most recent State of the Union address, President Obama called for an end to unnecessary duplication in government programs. I wholeheartedly agree with that. He also established an initiative called Government Reform for Competitiveness and Innovation, and he included several program cuts in his budget to help uh, eliminate waste. And as I close, I applaud the President's leadership, and I strongly support steps to help streamline government and make it more effective and efficient for the American people. I hope we can work together in a bipartisan way to improve rather than eliminate services to those struggling to meet the most basic needs of life. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, again, I thank you for your courtesy and I yield back. You bet. Thank you. Uh, we will now have our witnesses proceed. First, we are pleased to have Ms. Uh, Patricia Dalton, Chief Operating Officer of the Government Accountability Office. Thank you for your good work on the report. We also have Mr. Robert Rector, Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, an expert in, in, in welfare and uh, social welfare spending and reform. We have Mr. John Mashburn, uh, Executive Director of the Carlson Center for Public Policy. And as my colleague uh, mentioned earlier, we have Ms. Lisa Hamler Fugit with us, who is the Executive Director from the Ohio Association of Second Harvest Food Banks. So it is the uh, committee rules. Uh, all witnesses are sworn in. So if you please stand up and just, just uh, answer in the affirmative after I read. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. If so, uh, answer in the affirmative. Thank you. Let the record show that they all agreed. And we will now go right down the row. Um, we allow five minutes. Uh, there is a light system somewhere that you can see, I assume. In front of your name there. So, okay, you got it. Okay, great. Um, so you'll, you, know, you, get the, you guys know how it works. You get the yellow light when it is time to start slowing down and getting ready to, or speeding up and getting ready to finish, I guess. Um, <laughs> So, Ms. Dalton, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Kucinich, Ms. Burkle. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss GAO's first annual report on duplication in the Federal Government. Our report listed 34 areas where there is potential overlap, fragmentation, or duplication. Overlap and fragmentation can be harbingers of unnecessary duplication. We also identified in the report 47 other areas of potential cost savings or revenue enhancements. Reducing or eliminating government duplication, overlap, and fragmentation could potentially save billions of tax dollars annually and help agencies provide more efficient and effective services. The current situation of multiple and overlapping programs evolved over decades. Difficult decisions and sustained attention by the administration and the Congress will be required to determine what programs are needed now. This will be complicated by the fact that data showing the effectiveness or lack thereof of current programs is often nonexistent or insufficient. In addition, in some cases, we do not know exactly what we are spending. Today I will focus on four areas in our report, programs that provide assistance with food, employment and training, homelessness and transportation. First, the Federal Government spends more than $90 billion on domestic food assistance, provided primarily through 18 different Federal programs. The Departments of Agriculture, HHS, Homeland Security, and multiple State and local governments work to administer a complex ne network of programs. Some of these programs provide similar services to the same population. For example, six different USDA programs provide food to eligible children in settings outside their homes, such as schools, daycare, summer camps. While having multiple programs helps ensure that those in need have access to food, it also increases administrative costs. Complicating any decisions about streamlining food assistance programs is the fact that little is known about the effectiveness of 11 of the 18 programs. In fiscal year 2009, 47 programs spent about $18 billion on employment and training services. Of these 47, 44 overlap with at least one other program in that they provided at least one similar service to a similar population. For example, three of the largest programs provide job search assistance. Nearly all programs track outcome information, but only five of the 47 GAO identified have conducted an impact study to determine whether the program is actually responsible for improved employment outcomes. GAO has previously recommended to Labor and HHS that those agencies work together to develop and disseminate information that could inform State efforts to increase administrative efficiencies and examine the incentives for States and localities to undertake such efforts. In 2009, Federal agencies spent about $2.9 billion on over 20 programs targeted to address the various needs of persons experiencing homelessness. In some cases, different agencies may be offering similar types of services to similar populations. For example, at least 
seven Federal agencies administered programs that provide some type of shelter or housing assistance to persons experiencing homelessness. This fragmentation can create difficulties for people accessing services and administrative burdens for providers who must navigate various application requirements, selection criteria, and reporting requirements. The U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness has provided a renewed focus on coordinating efforts and recently has developed a strategic plan for agencies involved in the fight to end homelessness. However, once again, decisions on how to reduce this fragmentation and overlap could be hindered due to lack of comprehensive data. It is exacerbated by a lack of consistent definitions. Finally, GAO identified 80 existing Federal programs across eight Federal departments that provide funding for transportation services for those that have, are transportation disadvantaged. An example of the impact of fragmentation in this area is the Departments of Agriculture and Labor both fund programs that provide transportation for low-income youth seeking employment or job training. As in other areas I have discussed today, some actions are underway. For example, the Interagency Transportation Coordinating Council on Access and Mobility has taken steps to encourage and facilitate coordination across agencies, but more is need needed. In conclusion, opportunities exist to streamline and more efficiently carry out programs in these four areas. Careful, thoughtful analysis will be needed to address some of the issues discussed in our March report, and having comprehensive information on the programs involved would help facilitate that decision making. In our future reports, GAO will follow up on these areas as well as examine other areas in the government for potential duplication. We also have in-depth work ongoing in several selected areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That completes my prepared statement. I would be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much. We will move next to Mr. Rector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am here today to talk about means-tested welfare assistance, which means programs that are targeted to poor and low-income individuals providing cash, food, housing, medical care, and social services. So, for example, food stamps is a means-tested program, Social Security is not. Now, the big secret here is that the Federal Government runs over 69 major means-tested assistance programs. And the problem isn't so much duplication. But the fact that there are so many programs, no one in this city has any clue how much money you are spending on the poor. I mean, absolutely no clue whatsoever. It is as if when you look at the welfare state, it is as if you had a jigsaw puzzle with 69 different pieces. And the way that Congress operated was to look at one piece at a time, and only one piece, and then to pretend that that piece and that piece alone was the only thing that was standing between poor people and starvation. It automatically results in a massive over-expenditure. Imagine if you ran your family budget that way. You never added anything up. You just looked at each component one at a time, and that is the way we run the welfare state. In fiscal year 2011, total spending on these 69 programs was $940 billion. Seventy-five percent of that was Federal spending, twenty-five percent of it was State spending, mainly State contributions required into Medicaid. Combined Federal and State means-tested spending is now the second largest category of government spending overall in the nation. It is exceeded only by Social Security and Medicare. It exceeds the cost of public education. Let me repeat that. It exceeds the cost of public education, and it dwarfs the cost of national defense. In the two decades before the current recession, means-tested welfare was the fastest growing component of government spending. Never heard that in the Washington Post. It grew more rapidly than Social Security and Medicare, and the rate of increase dwarfed that of public education and national defense. Despite the fact that means-tested welfare was at record levels when he took office, President Obama has increased his spending by a third. But this is a permanent, not a temporary increase in spending. According to Obama's uh, spending plans, uh, means-tested welfare will not decline as the recession ends but will continue to grow rapidly for the next decade, will soon be over a trillion dollars a year. He plans to spend $10 trillion over the next decade at least. Now, about half of uh, this $950 billion goes to low-income families with children. That is about $470 billion a year. If that amount of money were divided evenly among the lowest income one-third of all families with children, which is about 15 million families, that comes to around $30,000 per family. The amount of money which is being put out there simply dwarfs anyone's understanding 
and, it, and to look at these programs one at a time completely misrepresents the type of assistance that is going. There is virtually no family out there that only gets aid from one program. Okay? They get aid from many different programs. The means-tested welfare system is a vast, hidden welfare state that the public and legislators know virtually nothing about. And you can't debate it or make rational decisions solely on a piecemeal basis. You have to look at this aggregate spending. What I would propose, in, and I would also say simply, the United States cannot afford to spend over a trillion dollars a year on low-income individuals, uh, money which we will mainly borrow from the Chinese. We have to get this spending under some type of reasonable constraint. We have to continue to spend. We certainly want to assist the poor, but we have to have some reasonable constraint. What I would propose is that we take this aggregate spending and when the recession ends, we should roll that spending back to the pre-recession levels, which was already a record level, already beyond anyone's understanding, and then allow it to grow at inflation for the rest for, 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 the, for the foreseeable future. That would be a reasonable compromise that would help us deal with our debt and our deficit, but would continue to provide very generous assistance to low-income persons. I would finally say that the biggest problem with these programs is not that they are inefficient, but that they generate poverty themselves. Every one of these programs rewards people for not working, and it rewards people from not marrying, and those are the two principal causes of child poverty. These programs generate need for themselves. The more money you put into them, the more people in need of aid you create, and therefore the more need for future spending you create. We need a welfare system that changes those incentives and encourages individuals to work and become self-sufficient and certainly encourages marriage rather than penalizes it. That is what Lyndon Johnson said when he launched the War on Poverty. He said, I don't want to put people on the dole. I don't want to put government, uh, people on government assistance. I want them to become prosperous and self-sufficient. That is what we need to do. Thank you. Appreciate that. Good testimony. Mr. Wash uh, Mashburn, excuse me. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member, Ranking Member Kuczynski. Oh, Mr. Mashburn, uh, pull that mic right down in front of your – there you go. There we go. That's uh, even better. Widespread agreement on the need to look at not just near-term steps, but at the long-term fiscal sustainability of government fiscal policy and government programs. However, it should be pointed out that this is just the latest in a long series of studies and reports over the past three decades regarding the need to reform and streamline the Federal Government programs to make them more efficient and responsive. Uh, while a lot of the duplication and overlap exist at the Federal level, the multitude of Federal programs serving similar populations are usually administered by a small handful of agencies at the State level, such as welfare or human services agencies or a State workforce agency. Much like the GAO re report before us, Congress in the late 1980s was confronted with the recommendations of the so-called Grace Commission, which President Reagan had established by Executive Order in 1982. The survey was conducted by over 2,000 private sector executives, managers, experts, and special consultants broken up into 36 task forces who submitted a 47-volume uh, report with a two-volume summary and made 2,478 recommendations. Presidents Reagan and Bush implemented those that they could administratively via the executive branch, but Congress essentially ignored those requiring legislative action the ones that would have saved the most dollars. The Clinton administration followed up with the National Performance Review in 1980, 1993, which offered approximately 380 major recommendations. Again, the Clinton administration implemented those that it could administratively through the executive branch, but Congress generally failed to implement those that had to be done legislatively. OMB then in 2004, under George W. Bush administration, then implemented the program assessment rating tool called PART to rate all Federal programs on their effectiveness in an effort to ensure Federal programs were accountable and achieved the results for which they had been originally established. Part evaluations then served as the basis for Bush administration recommendations for eliminating and cutting 150 programs. Again, Congress implemented or passed legislation to adopt very few of those recommendations. In short, the executive branch for three decades under both Republican and Democrat presidents have identified Federal programs, including welfare programs, that should be cut, eliminated, or reformed. Congress, however, has failed to act on the vast majority of the recommendations. Hopefully this hearing marks a different juncture in history. 
As we look at the latest rec recommendations for eliminating wasteful overlapping in an inefficient government as part of Federal programs, or, if, or as GAO euphemistically puts it, creating efficiencies that could put these agencies in a position to better assist program participants while decreasing administrative burdens, we should keep in mind Ronald Reagan's overarching principle as he grappled with the problems of welfare reform in California in 1968. Welfare needs a purpose, to provide for the needy, of course, but more than that, to salvage these our fellow citizens to make them self-sustaining and as quickly as possible independent of welfare. We should measure welfare success by how many people leave welfare, not by how many are at it. When Ronald Reagan testified several years later as governor before the Senate Finance Committee in February 1972, he set out several tenets he believed were necessary for welfare reform to succeed. Given broad authority to utilize administrative and policy discretion, the states are better equipped than the Federal Government to administer effective welfare programs. A system of guaranteed income, whatever it may be called, would not be an effective reform of welfare, but would tend to create an even greater human problem. A limit should be set on the gross income that a family would receive and still remain eligible for welfare benefits. For all those who are employable, a requirement be adopted that work in the community be performed as a condition of eligibility for welfare benefits without additional compensation. The greatest single problem in welfare today is the breakdown of family responsibility and strong provisions should be made to ensure maximum support from responsible parents. The TANF block grant for welfare assistance is based on these principles and is one of Reagan's greatest legacies. The now undisputed success of the TANF block grant is a testament to the leadership of Reagan and Bob Carlson, for whom the Carlson Center is his name, who was Reagan's welfare policy advisor, both when he was governor and when he was president, and Carlson continued his efforts uh, towards block granting welfare even after Reagan left office. Uh, under Reagan's vision, welfare reform is not just about saving taxpayers money, but moving beneficiaries from dependence to independence, as was often said during debate on passage of the 1996 welfare reform law. I would point out, uh, as, as Reagan was quoted, uh, addressed to the International Committee for the Supreme Soviet, the USSR, September 17, 1990, we have found in our country that when people have the right to make decisions as close to home as possible, they usually make the right decisions. Thank you. I would note that that was before the Soviets. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mashburn. We, they just called votes, but we want to hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Ham Refugent, and then we'll recess, come back for questions, I think is probably going to be the best. So, Lisa, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, and distinguished members of the committee. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I represent the Ohio Association of Second Harvest Food Banks, Ohio's largest charitable response to hunger. We provide food funding, training, and technical assistance and Ohio benefit bank services to a network of 3,000 food pantries, soup kitchens, and homeless shelters. Eighty percent of our charities are faith-based, volunteer-driven, operating on budgets of less than $25,000 a year. Half of all the food we distribute comes as a result of Federal and State funding. Over the last decade, the number of Ohioans have grown, uh, in poverty have grown by a staggering 46 percent, and the effects of the Great Recession are still with us. Deeper poverty, lower fixed incomes, minimum wages, part-time employment, and many are suffering from long-term unemployment. In the last quarter of 2010, our charity served nearly 2.1 million Ohioans and half of those we served were children and the elderly, yet every day more hungry Ohioans are standing in our lines and their limited budgets are now being further shattered by rapidly rising food and fuel costs. It is bad out there. Those who were already hanging by their fingertips are now falling into the abyss and the organizations that we serve are begging for crumbs and praying for a miracle. Mr. Chairman, the GAO produced a very balanced report and I support many of its findings, but there are some real-world realities to these findings that must be highlighted. One, program overlap does not always mean duplication. Some of these critical programs already have fixed funding, eligibility and enrollment caps and cannot respond to increased need, particularly in a weak economy. And many families who struggle with hunger are not poor enough to qualify for support. The consequences of increasing hunger and malnutrition are severe including lowered productivity, educational achievement, and astronomical health care costs. SNAP, the largest USDA program, served nearly 42 million uh, Americans. One in seven Americans received food stamps in February. It has the lowest eligibility of all Federal nutrition programs, and the maximum benefits last less than two and a half weeks out of every month. 
the GAO report describes the Commodity Supplemental Food Program as one of the duplicative programs, citing that many seniors eligible for this program are also eligible for SNAP. Yet seniors with limited mobility and transportation barriers may not be able to purchase food at a grocery store and therefore benefit from both the box of food provided through the Emergency Food Assistance Program and CSFP, as well as home delivered meals. In Ohio, a fortunate 20,463 seniors receive a 40 pound box of government food valued at $18.77 a month. The waiting list for this program is long, and many of our food banks report that seniors in their community call and ask for the CSFP box of a recipient that they know has gone into a nursing home or worse yet. Other non-participating seniors will read the obituaries, and if they see the name of someone that they know that's received CSFP, they ask if they can receive the deceased recipient's box of food. This is hardly a case of people getting too many benefits. Rather, it shows people do not have enough to eat. Another example of real-world reality of vulnerable Ohioans is that one out of every two babies born in Ohio is potentially eligible for WIC. A modest supplemental program like SNAP, it is not intended to meet the participants' entire nutritional needs. In fact, a study conducted by the University of Cincinnati Children's Hospital found that 65 percent of the families reported they had run out of formula and did not have money to buy more, and 39 percent of the families studied were already on WIC and SNAP, yet were at risk of hunger. All too often, these programs do not always reach the poor because of rules and requirements that are confusing, requiring families in need to produce multiple documents and verifications multiple times at multiple agencies and using up precious time and gas money traveling and sitting in waiting rooms of agencies that would be better spent in keeping a job and finding a new one and does not make sense for people with limited mobility. We agree with GAO that programs are decentralized, lack coordination and data sharing, all of which are required to improve efficiencies and effectiveness. I would like to briefly share our association's experience in reducing efficiencies and unnecessary overlap while ensuring that people receive access to benefits. Our association met this challenge head on. We implemented the Ohio Benefit Bank, an Internet based application assistance program which streamlines program access and reduces barriers by providing a single application platform of more than 20 programs. We have joined together nine state agencies and four federal agencies and have leveraged public and private resources, establishing, yes, over 1,100 not for profit and faith based and community partners and recruited some 4,300 counselors reaching people where they work, live, play and pray. Again, we believe that in order to prevent duplication and increase cost, excuse me, to um, prevent duplicative efforts and cost, investments are needed to upgrade and integrate systems used to determine and maintain eligibility across all health and human service li uh, lines. And again, I thank you for the opportunity and would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Let me thank uh, all our witnesses. We will be back in probably 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, nine, nine minutes left in this vote. We have to go over and vote, and then we will uh, appreciate the witnesses' patience and stand in recess. <laughs>